um, capturing emitted energy. It's oftentimes uh, argued that we are making a mistake by assuming that there's any energy to be captured because as the, as the atom is pushed into the cavity and, and, and again is pushed out of the cavity, somehow we're gaining, we're tapping into that energy that we were hoping to capture to move the atom. And I don't think that's the case. Because to take, for example, an ordinary hydrogen atom, and we have it in the, uh, the we have it in the ground state. So we have an atom of uh, hydrogen in the ground state. There's the electron. We illuminate with ultraviolet light. And by illuminating with ultraviolet light, we cause an, an excitation of the first level. So this is the Lyman alpha transition at uh, 12, 16 angstroms. And so we have an excited atom. And if we then have that atom enter into a region where there's an opaque shield, not a casimir cavity, just something to block out the ultraviolet light, then clearly the, the electron will drop down into its ground state orbit again, emitting Lyman alpha radiation. And then it'll move out again. And if we want to, we can we could repeat the process. Now, it does us no good because we're supplying, we're supplying the energy to do this. But the point is that just because the, uh, the atom is emitting energy in, in this region here where the uh, excitation radiation is being blocked, that's got nothing to do with any uh, pressure gradient needed to push the atom out. And so this is an analog, a very simple analog, of what we're proposing to do with zero point radiation. So I, I see no reason why there should be, one, and the analog is shown down here. In the, in the case of zero point radiation, instead of ultraviolet light, you have the zero point field. You have Casimir plates that block out the zero point field in the same way that these opaque shields block out the ultraviolet light. The, uh, the, there's an emission of light or whatever radiation, form of radiation. We don't know what part of the spectrum it will come out. And then upon reemergence, again, we expose it to the zero point field and it's re-energized. Um, could this be tested apart from, well, there are two ways, of course, to test this idea. One is to actually have energy generation take place in such a device. Another test would be a spectroscopic one. And there are a couple of ones that, I, that I've thought about that I think would work. One involves looking at the um, a transition, an outer shell transition of xenon-1, which is a noble gas. The uh, ordinary The ordinary transition between the outermost excited state and the, um, the uh, unexcited orbital uh, is known to take place at 1469.6123 angstroms. That's a well-known spectroscopic uh, data point. What I'm suggesting is that we took xenon-1 and put it inside a Casimir cavity. Both these orbitals would be influenced, would be modified to some extent. It's unlikely they'd be modified in exactly the same way. And so there's probably some differential between these two orbits. And so we would expect to measure a, a spectroscopic line at 1469.6123 plus or minus delta angstroms. So unless we happen to be extremely unlucky and have the effect, uh, have the zero point field effect occur exactly the same for both these orbitals, there should be some differential here. And so this spectroscopy experiment would show whether in fact orbitals are influenced by the zero point field the way we hope. Um, the problem with this is that you'd have to do it in, in vacuum because this radiation is at 1,400 angstroms. You can't do it in, or, in air. You have to do it in vacuum. That's difficult then because you have to put all your instrumentation into a vacuum chamber and so on. There's a simpler way to do it. Do it with hydrogen because you can do the same trick. In this case, we're looking at the, uh, the Balmer lines of hydrogen. The transitions from the uh, n equals 3 to n equals 2 state, 65, 63 angstroms, one of the most well-known lines in all spectroscopy or astrophysics. And again, we would expect to have a differential effect between these two orbitals so that the, the Balmer line would be shifted to 65, 63, plus or minus some delta, delta A in angstroms. Now, this is simpler because you don't have to do this in, in a vacuum. You can do this in air. The difficulty is that hydrogen is, is not monatomic. It naturally comes as a molecule. So you have to dissociate the hydrogen and at the same time excite the, the, the hydrogen molecules and then look at the cascade, the recombination spectrum, to see whether such a shift takes place. So this is a second spectroscopic test that doesn't suffer from the vacuum chamber requirement, but then suffers from the fact you have to, you have to dissociate the hydrogen uh, molecules and excite the resulting atoms into the state where you have then a recombination that at the end will give you a, a Balmer spectrum line that is shifted because of the effects of the Casimir plates. So the way to do this on a large scale would be to build, uh, for example, uh, plates that have uh, metallic strips put on them so that the, uh, the atoms would flow through Casimir cavities. You see that here's a Casimir cavity. And I just cut the top plate off so you can see the inside of this thing. So, so uh, the gas flow would go this way, crossing Casimir cavities, in and out, in and out, in and out of Casimir cavities. And a device like this can, ha can accommodate a million or more Casimir cavities. It's very simple to, to build such a device. 
Another one might be like this, a stack of uh, conductor and non-conducting layer plates with Casimir tunnels on the order of a, a tenth to one micron in diameter. And again, the, uh, the atoms would simply flow through, in this case, a tunnel, a tunnel that consists of many, many thousands of Casimir cavities. Each time it passes it into and out of a Casimir cavity, it would hope to take up some, some energy. And another way that, in fact, if Larry Lemke's in the room, I'll thank him for this. Uh, Another way to do that is to have a rotating device that looks very much like a CD, a stack of CDs, and the rotation of this will naturally pull gas through it, and as the, the, the gas then flows down the center and out through along the, uh, the, uh, the disks, the disks, of course, have, have uh, casimir cavities etched on them, you again get the same kind of effect. So there are various ways to do this, and um, we're hoping that this will be a new energy source. If we're correct, this is a game changer. I mean, it would be a free energy source. It would change things dramatically. On the other hand, we've, we've yet to demonstrate that the effect actually occurs. We have these good theoretical reasons to think it does, but, you know, uh, theoretical reasons are one thing and experimentation is something else. We uh, hope to fabricate a prototype. Gareth's been working on this. We did have some funding for a time from DARPA, and uh, the results from that were inconclusive. There was also some private funding, and uh, the experiment is still going on at a very low level here at the university. We need another several million dollars to do this right, to do this properly. And um, the design is based on microchip technology, which uh, Garrett tells, tells me and told all of us last night is pretty easy to do and pretty cheap to do. Um, so the, uh, the cost of building one of these things, if it works like this, would be very, very low. And uh, we're hoping that this demonstration can be built here at the university and, and show the effect and uh, that uh, this then becomes a game-changing result that emerges from within the SSE, let's put it that way. And I think I'm done. Do we have time for just a few questions? Uh, Bernie, you didn't say anything about the, the material. Is, it, is, is that uh, the, the casimir plates, uh, is, can it be metallic? or? Is, yeah, it's got to be metallic. It's got to be conducting. They have uh, to be conducting. They have to be conducting. They have to be conducting at the right wavelength, too, because if you go far enough in the ultraviolet, uh, materials lose their conductivity. So that's, that is another issue. We're sort of in a, a narrow range where there has to be the cavity has to be a certain size, and yet if we go down to that size, we may be stretching the conductivity properties of the, of the boundaries of the plates. So it's, it's, it gets a bit finicky and a bit tricky, but, but Garrett will solve all that. <laughs> uh, over here. Does it, uh, the effect gets stronger as you get smaller dimensions, right? So is, is there a point at which you could make this uh, a smaller scale device and get more energy, or is there sort of a trade-off? It, it does, yeah. I mean, if the theory is correct, then the electron, when it loses sort of the support of the radiation at one wavelength, it drops down into a lower, lower orbit, and that, may, that then is stabilized by the higher energies of the zero-point field. So the further it drops, the more energy comes out in principle, yes. So the trade-off Yeah, that's right, yes. Um, you, you and the, last night you talked about the size and uh, how, how much energy you're going to get. Yes. It doesn't clear to me you, you know how much of that energy you're going to be able to capture. Yeah, and it's how really... Can, how can you make these estimations without knowing that? Uh, it's a swag. Um, I was assuming that we had perhaps one electron volt per transition of an atom through the cavity. In the case of hydrogen, the, uh, the ionization is 13.6 electron volts. And so I'm assuming we had something like a few percent of the energy of the, uh, the, the, uh, the ionization, a few percent of the effective ionization energy from a given level. It, it, but it is a swag, it's a guess. Okay, it's clear that this uh, <coughs> talk has generated lots of questions which we won't have time for at this time. Um, hopefully Bernie will be available at the break. I'll be around. And, and later. So thank you again. <laughs>